Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options education webinar series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And today what we're going to do is review the lessons that we've learned here in the month of October. Two of which I think are two of the most important lessons to learn, regardless of whether you're brand new to options trading or if you're an experienced options trader, which is the mechanics of entering and exiting an options position so that you can maximize your orders so that you get the best possible price execution. In order to understand that, it just requires a basic understanding of entering and exiting option positions within uh, in terms of order entry, and then a little bit about liquidity and how the quotes on your screen give you some clues around liquidity so that you can utilize those tools to help you get the best possible execution price. And then the second lesson we learned here in the month of October is, for those of you that are perhaps struggling sometimes with trading, how to think about trading psychology, how to think about your trades. And making sure that you're actually focusing on the right aspect of your trading. What we tend to find most retail traders that struggle with trading are simply focused on many times of what we consider the wrong thing. And it's very easy to get stuck into focusing on the wrong thing. So today we want to talk a little bit about trading psychology, what you should be focused on and how you can turn around uh, what could be uh, you know, losing or unprofitable a portfolio or a portfolio where you struggle with some large losses, how to hopefully help you prevent that to begin with so that you can become successful as a trader in the long run. Now, these are both webinars that we recorded back here in October. If you missed any of those webinars, I highly recommend that after we finish here today that you take some time to go back and review those courses because they're very important, in my opinion, for the success of traders. So, Let's go ahead and get started. My, uh, but before we do, what we're going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. Now, we're going to start off with these types of uh, sessions with a similar format. Or we're going to start off with a broader market update. I'll, I'll show you the, um, the current market and where we currently sit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to review what we've learned here this month, which is first, uh, entering option orders. We'll talk a little bit about, um, for those of you that are relatively new to options trading, the, the mechanics of entering an options order. But more importantly, we're here to talk about pricing and liquidity. Understanding a little bit about how the bid ask quote on your screens are displayed, what do they mean to you, and how can you use that information to maximize your option orders. We see a lot of users tend to use the wrong metrics to gauge liquidity and many times either miss out on what is a a good trade or perhaps um, trading something that they should not have uh, traded to begin with. And then we'll talk a little bit about trading psychology. Again, one of the most important rules, uh, one of the more important aspects to learn about options trading before diving in. And then the golden rule of risk management. Once you learn that trading psychology, how can you use that lesson, how can you apply rules so that you stick to that lesson that you've learned? And that's really the golden rule of risk management. And at the very end, what we'll do is we'll open this up for Q&A. And this is also an opportunity for you guys to submit some symbols for us to take a look at together. So that's what we're going to cover here today. But predominantly, the lesson that I want everyone to be able to walk away from today's session is really how can you maximize your options orders and improve your execution price. That's what we have learned here in October. So I want to review that and make sure that everyone understands how to go about doing that. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And what I want to share with you is really the lessons that I've learned as a market strategist um, over the past 15 years, working with both retail and institutional investors, making sure that they understood how to think about their trading psychology. Um, you know, as a strategist, I've worked with thousands of retail traders. So I have seen just about every single possible 
strategy under the sun. I've seen successful traders. I've seen a ton of traders that struggle with trading and struggle with being profitable in trading. So this is really a summation of what I have learned as a strategist to help clients to become successful and become profitable at trading and hopefully share some of that knowledge here uh, with you guys here today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the first uh, slide here. So what, what we want to first talk a little bit about is uh, uh, this is for more, more so for those of you that are relatively new to options trading. And because when you're trading options and you're entering an order to enter, either enter an options position or close an options position, the number of parameters that you need to enter are actually quite large. So it's really important for beginners to understand this from the very beginning so that you can enter your option orders correctly. Uh, some beginners who, who don't take the time to learn many times have difficult or sometimes expensive lessons in understanding how to enter your orders properly. So whenever we talk about uh, order entry with respect to options, the first thing that's different between trading stocks and options is the fact that when you trade options, you need to specify on the order type whether this is a order to open a new trend, a new position, or this is an order to close an existing position. So the, the rest of it is the same. You either buy first and then sell later, or you can sell first and then buy back later, just like a stock. You can, you, you can go long the stock or you can go short the stock. Same thing with an option. You can go long the option or short the option, but you do have to specify whether you're going long to open or you're going short to open. Uh, and you must specify the correct one. Otherwise your order can get rejected or you might be opening up a new position when you're trying to close out an existing one. Now, what you just have to do is make sure that you match up the opposite order for when you're trying to exit. So if you're buying an option to open, you wanna make sure that when you close it, you enter a sell to close order. Vice versa, if you sold an option to open, when you're ready to close it, you want to make sure that you want to buy it back, but to close, buy to close. So that's the first lesson. And I think most of you that are that are experienced in options trading, you've probably learned this already. For those of you that are still in the process of learning how to trade options and you have not placed your first options trade, this is something that you want to pay attention to. Um, and I do recommend if you've never traded an option before to go back to my recording at the beginning of October, where we talked about this more in depth and gave you more examples of opening transactions and closing transactions and the different aspects that you need to um, enter is part of your order. Now, the most important thing I think for a lot of experienced options traders, even, even what I consider very experienced options traders, we tend to find that there is a very large degree of uh, of metrics that different users tend to use to gauge liquidity. So when we're buying or selling a stock or an ETF, most of us don't consider uh, liquidity very much. We just assume that we should be able to execute at least a few hundred or maybe uh, a couple of thousand shares that most retail traders are trading and assuming that markets are usually liquid enough to accommodate that. However, when it comes to options, there seems to be a perception that there's a lack of liquidity. I get a lot of comments from investors saying that there's no liquidity in Canadian options or no liquidity in certain symbols. And, you know, I always tell users, you know, a market maker is there and they'll usually make a market in at least 20 to 30 contracts. So to say that there isn't liquidity, I don't think is particularly fair. I think most users have a tough time gauging as to what liquidity actually means and how much liquidity there is. So I wanted to provide investors with a different view. And what I'm doing is I'm providing the, the view from the other side of the transaction. So you as a, buy, as a, as a retail trader wanting to execute a trade, on the other side of the trade, there's a market maker. And I wanted to provide some perspective as to what the market maker is actually doing to give you a better sense for how to gauge liquidity. So 
the best way to think about markets is really think of them as one large auction. And there are lots of players in this particular large auction of which every player is willing to buy and sell at a specific price. So when you look at your screen and you get a bid and ask price on your screen, how many of you currently use the bid ask quote to gauge liquidity? Please type one into the chat window. Um, if you use the bid ask spread to gauge liquidity of an option. Okay, I see a few ones. Now, how many of you, on the other hand, use open interest or volume to gauge liquidity? Please type two into the chat window if you prefer to use open interest or volume. Now, twos, all of, it seems like there are, let's see, um, I've noticed a, a fairly equal amount of ones and twos, but it does seem like there are more twos, people who use open interest and volume. So the one thing I will tell you is that if you think about it from the market maker's perspective, um, you know, a market maker doesn't care how many options have been opened up or how many uh, contracts have traded today, that doesn't factor into his ability to make a market in that specific option, which is why we always tell investors, the bid ask price is always a far better gauge for liquidity than anything else. And in order to understand that, we need to understand what is a bid price and what is an ask price. So if you think of the markets as one large auction, the bid price is simply this, the highest price anyone on the open market is willing to pay for that specific asset. Forget the fact that that asset is an option for one second. Think of it as maybe um, a house, right? You have a bunch of bidders looking to, or, or let's not use a house. Let's use something like, let's say the new iPhone um, that's, that someone is trading on the secondary market. So you have an iPhone available on eBay and you have uh, people who want to buy that iPhone and different people have different prices they're willing to pay for it. And then you have sellers for that same iPhone. You have people who have an iPhone who are willing to let it go. And you have a, a various list of prices that people are willing to sell it at. And the bid and ask price simply reflects the highest price anyone's willing to pay for a specific asset. And the asking price is the lowest price someone's willing to accept to sell that asset. That's how you get a bid and ask price. And bid and ask price is simply just a collection of all the possible uh, prices that people are willing to buy and sell at and aggregating them together so that you get the highest possible bid price and the lowest possible ask price. Now, why is this important? Now, in order to understand this, you have to understand how market makers work. Because if let's say, if let's say, um, uh, you know, something is fairly competitive, right? Meaning there are lots of buyers and sellers of a specific asset. We can use iPhones as an example or any other product that's widely used. What you're going to see is that the bid and ask pricing are going to be fairly close to each other. Why? Because if something trades very actively and I'm as a market maker want your business, guess what? I can't charge a very large markup to sell and I can't charge a very large markup to buy or else another competitor or another market maker will come in and make a better market and steal the volume from me. So when something is very competitive, I want to mark up my prices as little as possible. So we usually think of the mid price as fair value. And the reason that we can use the mid price as our fair value is from understanding how a market maker works. Because a market maker, when they compete, when they give you these prices, the lowest price they're willing to sell and the, low, and the highest price they're willing to buy, what they're really telling you is uh, what they believe as fair value. Because how a market maker produces these bid-ask quotes is he has to first calculate a fair value. And then what he does is he marks it up on both sides. Um, because him as, as a market maker, he just wants to be able to buy at this price, $7.95, and sell it to you at $7.75 and make the 20 cent difference. That's what a market maker is trying to do. And, and he decides how competitive he wants to be depending on how liquid the symbol is. Because if something's very liquid and trades very actively, he's not going to be able to mark it up by very much or else someone else will come in, mark it up by a smaller amount and take his business. Um, so he has to stay competitive and make a fairly tight market. Now, if something is less liquid, so if let's say there's something that doesn't trade very often, then he, guess what? He doesn't have to be very competitive. So he has the same fair value calculation, but he might mark it up 
uh, you know, substantially long higher because guess what? It's just something that doesn't trade very often. That's why bid ask quotes are by far the better alternative in terms of gauging liquidity because something doesn't have to trade in order for it to be liquid. Because think about it, an option has zero open interest in volume when it gets listed. Every single option that gets listed ever, no matter how liquid something is, always starts off with zero open interest and volume. So zero openness and volume is not a good gauge of liquidity at all. The bid ask spread is a far better gauge for liquidity because th and the only way to understand that is to understand how market makers even give you that bid ask quote. A bid ask quote is basically a markup off of the what the market maker intends as or what he perceives to be as a fair value of that option. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type three into the chat window if that makes sense to you. And, and we know this, and we and because we know this, that's how we can use the mid price. As are, as are what we consider as the fair value of an option because market makers will always mark up roughly the same amount to the upside as they do to the downside. So when we get the bid ask quote from a market maker, what we can do is we can assume that the midpoint between the bid and the ask quote is the perceived fair value of that option. So when we have this perceived fair value of the option, first of all, it doesn't really matter how much someone tries to mark it up by, because you can think of the bid ask price as the sticker price of a, of a car when you walk onto a car dealership. It's just what their advertised prices are. So market makers can, can advertise prices, but remember, Markets are one large auction. You can participate in that auction the same way a market maker can. That's the power of these uh, free flowing markets is the fact that information is passed to you from the market makers in terms of what his markup is. It also gives you a fair sense for, for what the fair value of the security is. And you can use this information to your advantage when you're placing an order because when you're entering an order, let's say you're trying to buy this particular option that's currently quoted to you at 775 by 795. What you know from that information is that the fair value of that option is actually 785. So doesn't matter what the advertised price is, this is a free flowing market. You can interact with that quote. You can say, okay, the fair value is 785. So if I wanna buy it from that market maker, I just have to offer him some price better than 785 because the market maker is there to try to make a spread over what the fair value is. So if I know the fair value is at 785 and I know the sticker price that he has on that order on that asset 795, what do you do? You know, think about when you walk onto a car dealership, what do you do? You know what the fair value is, you know what the sticker price is, where do you start? You start at the fair value and you try to work your way up until the dealer or the market maker or whoever's selling you the asset says, okay, I'll take that price. And the great thing about option markets is that it doesn't cost you anything to, to try. It doesn't cost you anything to make an offer and see if it's accepted by the market maker or the car dealership or anywhere else. You, there's nothing stopping you from, from exploring. And that's the beauty of the markets. So when you're trying to enter an order here to buy, what you always want to do is start at the midpoint at 785 and see if the market maker is willing to fill you at 785 at the fair value. Most of the time you'll find that they're not willing to pay, they're not willing to sell to you at fair value because if they sold it to you at fair value, they wouldn't make any money. And that makes sense, right? Everyone, every participant in the, in the market needs to, uh, in, the transaction needs to make financial sense for them to do it. So if they're not going to make any money, they're not going to place that trade. How, however, that doesn't stop you from entering an order at $7.86. So, you know, you can move your you can move your orders by one penny, seven dollars and eighty six cents, seven dollars and eighty seven cents, until the market maker says, "Okay, I will take that order." And maybe at that time, the market more, the market maker says, "At seven dollars and eighty seven cents, I'll take that because I've made a two cent um, a spread on the buy." Maybe he's thinking that a few minutes later he'll he'll be able to sell this for seven seventy or seven seventy five, and he's willing to take that two cent markup on the upside, and then perhaps make another five or ten cents to the downside, and he'll total make maybe seven to twelve cents on that particular trade. And 
So from a market maker's perspective, this is something that happens all the time. So that if you're trying to buy, you use the fair value as your, as your starting point and you work your way out towards the uh, asking price. And then if you're selling, just the exact opposite. You start at your fair value and you start working your way down towards the bid price. You know for a fact that they will fill you at the bid price, but again, that's the advertised price. You don't necessarily want to pay the sticker price, at least not right off the bat, unless you absolutely need to get in and out of that trade immediately. Then perhaps you might move immediately to the bid price or the ask price. But if you're trying to work your orders, if you're trying to save yourself some capital, this is one way to go about doing so. Because if you think about it, the difference between paying $7.85 and $7.95 is $10 per contract. So if, you, if you're trading 10 contracts, that's 100 Canadian dollars. Uh, you know, a lot of investors I hear over the past, uh, you know, I've been teaching in Canada since 2017. One of the predominant, um, I would say, uh, complaints that I've heard over and over again is really how high the commissions are for Canadian brokers. And, and then when you look at the bid-ask prices in Canada, a lot of times, you know, you, you could, from your order entry, save yourself uh, many times tens of dollars, many times hundreds of dollars, depending on the contracts that you are trading. So I always tell users that I know commissions may sound high at $10, but you might very well be giving up far more than that on your order execution. Or you can make back a very large chunk of that through your order execution if you're maximizing your order execution. So it's very important for investors to understand what does the midpoint actually tell you and how can you use that to your advantage to hopefully get yourself a better price. It gives you information as to what the market maker perceives the fair value of something is, and you can start your way up and marking up a smaller amount until you get the order execution that you're looking for. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type four into the chat window if that makes sense to you. Okay, perfect. So, Moving on, I do want to talk and spend a couple of minutes talking about what we consider frustrating trading experiences because I have been working as a market maker, uh, as a market strategist for almost 15 years now. And I have seen consistently this type of behavior from investors. And many times when I see this type of behavior, I tend to see investors blame the wrong thing on what causes it. So if any of you can relate to this, um, I have seen this over and over again in retail traders where they have a series of small winners and losers. So, you know, the green, the blue line is kind of the, uh, the P&L of each individual trade. You have small winners, small losers, you know, a few hundred dollars here, a few hundred dollars there. And, you know, slowly this, the green line shows how your account has grown over time. So you're growing your account slowly, slowly, slowly. And then once in a while, I see these one trade that, that causes a very large um, loss in their portfolio. And then from there, they go back to a series of small wins and small losers. Um, and so what you have is are accounts that grow at a fairly slow and steady pace, but followed by large declines and then slow and steady uh, gains and then large declines. If any of you can relate to this, please type five into the chat window or have found yourself struggling with trading, you know, with series of, of events like this, where you, you know, for periods of time, you do okay, small wins, small losses. And then you have, once in a while, you have these huge losses in your portfolio. Now, what I tend to find, and so many of you have said that you relate to this, and, and you know, as, as I've said, in my 15 years, this is what I see over and over and over again in retail traders. And when I see this type of behavior, when you have these large losses in your portfolio, many times the, the investor that suffers these losses, they blame their strategy. They blame the indicators they use. They blame the, the, the services that they follow. Um, rarely do they blame you know, themselves or blame the, the trading um, uh, you know, risk parameters, they, they usually blame the strategy. They think that there's something flawed about their strategy. Their strategy got them into the wrong trade. Um, but when you look at this chart, 
And you see that, you know, these large losses happen fairly infrequently, but they happen at such a large magnitude. From my perspective, that doesn't speak to the strategy, that doesn't speak to the indicator, that that's not the person that you're following that's, that's wrong here. What's wrong here is clearly risk management, because if it was the strategy or if it was the person that you're following is just a terrible trader, or if your indicators are somehow adjusted incorrectly, then what you would see are you know, losses all the time. It wasn't, it wouldn't be just, you know, one large loss that blows a huge hole in your portfolio. It would be more like this. If you, if it truly was your indicators that were wrong or the trading strategy that you're using is bad, you would see a series of losses. It wouldn't be that one large loss that blows the big hole in your portfolio. And when I, when I look at this and I, and I compound that with the, the um, I would say the reasons that many investors tell me that they have unprofitable positions, what it ends up t telling me is a very important lesson that I've learned as a market strategist. And that is the fact that when you're trading, there are two types of ways to view trading um, because, and, and this is a theory uh, created by someone named James P. Kars in 1986. He wrote a book called Finite Versus Infinite Games. And in order to understand this, it's, it's, it's quite simple to understand, but once you truly grasp it, that's how you can truly change how you perceive and how you think about trading. So, and James, uh, you know, theorizes there's two types of games. There's infinite versus uh, finite games. Finite games are games that we're all familiar with. Uh, games that have defined players. They have a fixed set of rules. And at the end of the game, the, the game will end. And at the end of the game, there's declared both a winner or a loser and a loser based on the rules of that game. So these are games that we're all familiar with, whether it's football, basketball, blackjack, chess, um, any types of games like these are what we consider finite games. And the goal of the game when you play a finite game is to win. You use the rules, you use skill, and you use, and you're trying to win. Um, and, your, and your sole goal in this is to prevent yourself from losing in that particular game. Now, James also theorized that there's a second type of game or what he called infinite game. And, and what he said in an infinite game, there are known and unknown players. So there are players that you know and players that you don't know about. There are no agreed upon rules. So it's just whatever goes. And the game never ends in an infinite game. And that's why we call it an infinite game. And in an infinite game, what he theorizes is that there's no such thing as winning or losing because the game never ends. What he says is that there are players, meaning, play, meaning um, players who have the resources or the will to continue playing in that game. And then you have what we call dropouts, meaning players who no longer have the will or the um, and resources to continue playing in that game. And I think a good example of an infinite game is, is running a business or starting a business. You can start a business, but guess what? You can never win at owning a business. You can, you can either be in business or you can no longer, be, or you, you know, you're out of business because you are bad at running your business effectively. Um, but there's no winning or losing in that particular case. Um, so, or, or such as running a casino. There's no such thing as winning or losing at, at, at running a casino. You're either profitable as a casino or you're not profitable as a casino and, you're, and you run out of business. And guess what? Trading is really very, very similar. Trading is the same thing because you can't win at trading. You simply cannot. You can either have the resources to continue trading, meaning you have enough capital in your account to, to place a trade today, or you could have blown up your account and you no longer have enough resources to continue trading. And this is a very, very important distinction because when I hear from users and I get questions like this all the time from someone who tells me, hey, I've placed a trade, I've lost some money. How do I make my money back? Or how do I make sure that I don't lose on this trade? What can I do to prevent a loss? And when I, when I hear questions like that from, from investors, what it immediately points me to is that they're thinking about trading from a from the wrong perspective they're still thinking about winning and losing and they're simply thinking that if i just win more often i'll be profitable and that is absolutely unfortunately the wrong way to think about trading because what when trading there's no there's no such thing as winning and just by preventing losses does not per, does not per make you a profitable trader and, and, and unfortunately it's actually the inherent um 
it's actually the inherent need as human beings to win and be right that causes us to do trade that causes us to put ourselves in positions that cause these large large losses because how does that large loss materialize it doesn't just come out of thin air what happens is usually is traders will have a small loss on their portfolio and you know, traders will say to themselves, you know what, that was a trade I was really sure about, you know, I, I was sure that that stock was going to go higher, I thought that stock was going to go lower. And even though I've lost money on that trade, you know what, I'm still confident in my trade, I'm still confident that I can win, I'm still confident that I can turn this loser around. So let me do something to maybe get myself back to break even and you start to see this behavior come in, where it has nothing to do with, um, you know, the, the long-term thought of my portfolio and had nothing to do with thinking about, you know, how do I make sure that I have enough capital to stay in business or keep trading? It's this thought about not losing. Um, and, and it's a very human, um, a, a human need, if you will, to be right or, or not be wrong. So what we do is we find ways to justify that. And this is the psychology part of trading where you have a small loss, and from my perspective, as a, as a professional trader, you would say to yourself, you know, what, why did I lose money on this trade? Was it because my thesis was wrong? Is it because my, my trading strategy is wrong? The reality is no matter what thesis, no, what trading strategy you use, there's going to be a significant chunks of, of your trades where you're just going to be flat out wrong. And what, what differentiates a professional trader from everyone else that struggles with trading is that a professional trader can can look at that trade and say, okay, this is a time where the strategy didn't work out. Let me take my two, $300 loss and I'll still have most of my portfolio intact to continue trading another day. Because my goal as a trader is guess what? My goal is to stay in business, be, remain as a trader and make sure that no matter what happens that I don't drop out. How do you drop out of trading? You drop out by blowing up your account. And what I've seen over and over again are traders who have a small loss in their portfolio, but instead of wanting to just accept that loss and move on, they'll do things like, okay, how can I, you know, maybe add a little bit more risk to my portfolio, but if the trade then goes back in my favor, I'll make money and I won't lose any money and I'll be better off in my portfolio. So it's this, it's this aversion to loss that many times, unfortunately, leads us to significantly larger losses. Because in order to try to turn around that trade, what you have to do is you have to take on more risk, right? So you might buy a call option for a dollar. It's now trading at 50 cents, but now you're even more convinced the stock's gonna go higher. So you buy more call options, hoping that that 50 cent option goes back up to 75 cents or a dollar or maybe $2, and hopefully you end up making money. So you throw more money at it. And guess what? Perhaps that trade works out, but many times that trade doesn't work out and you find yourself into a bigger hole. And now you say to yourself, wow, now I've lost significantly more money than I have on my any all of my other trades. I feel that I'm, I, I really feel that I can't lose this money. I have to do something. I gotta, I gotta get myself back to break even. And you get into this pattern of putting more money at it and maybe the trade goes even further south. And so now what was a very small loser turns into a significantly larger loser. And unfortunately, sometimes people do this over and over again, because at some point this loss becomes so large, they can, really can't afford to lose it. So they really throw Hail Marys at it, hoping that they're going to get themselves back to a small win. But instead, what you end up happening is multiple um, uh, lapses, if you will, in, in risk management that causes these big, big losses in, your, in a portfolio. So if any of you can relate to that, please type six into the chat window. Um, because if you can relate to it, the good news is the fact that all you have to do is identify and understand that this is caused not by your strategy. It's not because you have a bad strategy that causes this. It all comes down to how you think about your pos your positions. Do you think of your positions as winners and losers? Or do you think about um, the infinite game, meaning staying in business so that you can remain a trader another day? Because if you think about the infinite game, what you stop worrying about is being right or wrong and winning and losing. What you start thinking about is do the decisions, are the decisions that I'm making today, do they allow me to continue trading or do they put me at risk of dropping out as a trader? And what you realize is that the type of behavior that typically causes these types of significant losses are all because folk, 
traders are focused on winning and not on staying in the game. Because when you focus on winning, that's what causes those large losses. And, and what's unfortunately ironic is that in the pursuit of winning, that's usually what causes investors to drop out because it's it's the pursuit of winning that, that adds on to significantly more risk where you're not thinking about how do I prevent myself from from dropping out, you're just thinking about winning, and unfortunately, I, uh, you know, that is what causes you to actually drop out. So that is the psychological shift that you have to make as a trader to better understand how your brain works, how your brain um, uh, interprets risk and reward, so that you can hopefully turn this around. Now, the the better news is that once you understand, how, you know, once you understand this and think about how your brain is wired and, and reshift your, your thinking as to what's more important, which is winning is not more important. Staying in the game is far more important because if you can stay in the game, you can keep trading tomorrow. But if you blow up your account, you can't continue trading. So once you make that shift, the rules for how to actually prevent yourself from blowing up your account is actually surprisingly simple. And the rule of thumb is really, really easy, which is simply never risk more than one, sorry, one to 2% of your entire account per trade. So if you have, uh, this is your account value here on the left-hand side and whoops, this is your account value here on the left-hand side. And what you have to do is calculate the one to 2% of that account value. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, that means each individual in each individual options trade should never risk more than 1,000 to $2,000. If you ever exceed that, guess what? You're going to start putting your portfolio at risk of blowing up your account. And and we, we go through some of the math here uh, for those of you that want to watch the full recording as to why that one to 2% rule is so important. You know, a lot of people will say, well, why, why can't I go to two to 3%? You certainly can go to two to 3%, but what you're going to find is that throughout your trading career, when you, when you hit that series of consecutive losses, every single trader, every single strategy in the world is always going to have a, some period of time where you have five, six, perhaps even seven losing trades in a row. May not happen very often, but once in a while that happens. And you want to make sure that when it does happen, you don't put yourself at risk of blowing up a significant chunk of your account. The only way to do that is to stay within this one to 2% rule. So in the full recording, for those of you that are going to go back and watch it, we spend a lot of time helping you understand why this one to 2% rule is in place. But if you just stick to that rule, you will find yourself very rarely in a position where you ever are in um, the uh, at risk of losing, you know, a significant chunk of your account or blowing up your account. So, how can you succeed at trading, and how can you start turning around, you know, the profit, you know, the profitability of your account? Is number one, remember that you're playing an infinite game. You're not playing to win. There's no winning in an infinite game. So stop trying to win. Do everything you can to stay in the game by protecting your account. When you focus on protecting your account, that's how you know that you will never blow up your account, and that the upside will always be there because the upside will no longer be there. The second and you blow up your account because you do not have an infinite amount of capital to continue risking in the market. You only have a finite amount. So make sure that you reduce that, that downside risk. Once you're able to reduce that downside risk, the upside will always be there, but there will be no upside if you blow up your account. And that is the most important thing to learn as an investor, uh, regardless of whether you're trading stocks, options, futures, Forex, this rule of thumb is the same. And this is what differentiates anyone who's a professional trader and does it for a living and everyone else who unfortunately struggles with being profitable at trading. And the rule of thumb is really simple. Never risk more than one to 2% of your account per trade. And what that's going to do, that's going to minimize your portfolio drawdown. And even if you have five to six consecutive losses in a row, which again, as any trader will tell you that has traded long enough, is that you're likely going to have some point in your career, many, likely sometime within your year, 
that where you might have five to six consecutive losing trades in a row. And even with, with the best uh, risk management techniques, you'll be fine, except you know, having that five to six you know, consecutive losses in a row. I know plenty of portfolios that if you had five to six losses in a row, you know, investors would blow up a very significant chunk of their portfolio and they can no longer continue trading without depositing more money. If you find yourself in that position, guess what? Every single year, you're going to be at some point in the year, you might blow up your account. And you're going to have to redeposit money before you can start trading. If that's a pattern that you want to stay in, then keep doing what you're doing. But unfortunately, I don't think any of you want to do that. So the best way to prevent that is to trade small so that even when you have that five to six consecutive losses in a row, you're not in a position where you've blown up a significant portion of your account. You cannot continue trading. And the last thing I want to leave investors with is that even if you stick to that one to 2% rule, you still need to make sure that you distribute your trades across expirations, across sectors, and across long and short. And the reason I say this is because sometimes people will say, okay, I'm going to risk 2% on BMO, 2% of Royal Bank of Canada, 2% of Royal Bank of, of um, uh, you know, or a Bank of Nova Scotia. And so if you have all these long names that all expire on the same day and they're all in the same sector, and you have 10 trades that each take up 22% of, of your portfolio, well, guess what? Then you haven't really distributed your trade at all. It's just like risking 20% of your entire account on one trade because you have them all exposed into the same sector. They all expire on the same day. So if that you have a bad week before expiration, you can wipe out all of the positions that you have. So you have to not only think about you know, the individual positions that you have, you also have to think about, you know, how does the risk of your entire portfolio uh, stack up, you know, and think about whether or not that risk is concentrated in a specific timeline, specific sector and long short, or do you have them fairly spread out by expiration, by sector, by long short, um, because that is the best practice on how to manage risk for your overall portfolio. So with that, what I'll do is I will do a quick market update here in terms of where the Canadian markets currently sit. And what I want to do is I want to give everyone a brief overview of the Canadian markets and also provide everyone an opportunity to submit some symbols for us to take a look at together, as well as uh, answer any questions you guys might have regarding um, the the. Uh, the, the, the topics that we just discussed here today. So first of all, I'll start off with the TSX uh, 60, uh, TSX composite index, uh, the XIU ETF that tracks the Canadian TSX uh, composite index. So one thing you know we'll, we'll point out here is that the Canadian markets after breaking out above this $24 level, which is a major resistance level here on XIU back here in mid July, rallied all the way up to that 2550 level here to the downside, came back to retest this 24 level as support and then held that level after the September sell-off and tried to rally back towards that 25 and a half, but has failed now and is now going back to resume that $24 support. So at this point, first of all, I think it's pretty clear that we're going to retest this $24 support. The question is whether or not that level can hold. It did hold fairly strongly here after the September sell-off here. So for now, our expectation is to see that $24 level hold. But given that the current price action has been fairly weak, you could see another bounce and then uh, perhaps a break below 24 here to the downside. So there is risk there. And the important thing is to pay attention here to that $24 level. Now, for investors that are bullish here on the markets, I would wait till we get closer to that $24 level to look for a long entry. And the reason for that is really coming, it comes down to risk to reward, right? Because if you can get a long entry around the $24 area, then you have a move all the way up to about that 25 or target that 25 level to the upside. And if it gets all the way down to 23, 23, 70, 23, 60, you can cut your losses and take a stop loss here. So you're risking about 30 to 40 cents to the downside to try to make roughly a dollar here to the upside. So from a risk to reward perspective, you want that type of risk to reward. And the only way to get it is be patient 
and wait for XIU to get closer to that $24 level. If instead you went long right now when it's around 24, 25, then you only have about 75 cents to the upside and you would need to take on about closer to 50 to 60 cents of the downside in terms of your stop loss. So your risk to reward ratio there is closer to one to one, which is not as attractive. So from my perspective, you know, the U.S. elections are obviously something that is probably on many investors' mindset at the moment in terms of what the outcomes of that election are going to be, whether or not we're going to see a contested election, which is certainly one that many investors are concerned about in terms of creating volatility for the markets. And I think the Canadian markets are, you know, are signaling the same type of concern with markets. U.S. markets are down here today, breaking below some support levels. Um, XIU moving a little lower here, uh, looking like it's about to retest the $24 level. If you look at XFN, which is the financials ETF, this is one where financials, even though it has lagged behind the broader markets here since the coronavirus sell-off here, the as you can see, the XFN has moved very, very slightly since the March lows, only about a you know, 10 to 15% off in the March lows, while XIU has moved significantly uh, higher ahead of that. But over the past couple of months here, we've seen a slow rotation, or at least um, XFN has stemmed the underperformance of the financial sector. Financials have underperformed pretty much since the May, uh, March lows, but over the past month has actually kept up with the broader markets here. If you look at XFN over XIU, the two have been performing on par with each other, and that speaks to the fact that financials are no longer underperforming here in the broader markets, and that it is actually performing on par with the broader markets. This is the slow rotation that we continue to see into financials because financials has been one of the worst performing sectors behind energy off of those, those March lows or over the past multi, past couple of years. So to see financials at least perform on par with the market is generally speaking constructive for the industry. But overall, energy is still looking fairly weak here for the Canadian markets. So with that, what I want to do is I want to open this up for q and I want to open this up for anyone. To, if you have some symbols that you want us to take a look at together to be able to have an opportunity to submit them and take a look at, look at them together using options play. So if you have any questions Questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A window. And if you have any symbols that you want to take a look at, we can take a look at those together. So Dean is asking, question for the Q&A. Does the market maker set the price? I recently wrote uh, uh, an Air Canada uh, call option here and received 50 cents of the premium. I noticed the next day the premium jumped by 20 cents and is still higher. What drives the price higher? So Dean, I mean, the stock price is what drives the, the price higher significantly uh, more than anything else. Um, it's hard for me to specify, you know, your specific uh, price, um, your specific execution price, unless I was able to take a look at it. Um, but this is really something that you can utilize, uh, hopefully going forward to give you a sense for what is the fair value of that option when you sold it and try to get as close to that fair value as possible. So if you receive 50 cents, perhaps the fair value was 70 cents and you could have put in an order at 65 cents and gotten an extra 15 cents. So use the midpoint as your gauge. And John's next question I think is a good segue. And John's question was, I currently hold an option that has a very wide bid ask spread, five cents by $5, which was not the case when I purchased it. How do you handle this case? John, that's a good um, question here. So, uh, the you know, usually that doesn't happen very often that something gets less liquid, um, but usually those are options that we would avoid getting into to begin with. So maybe when you entered it, it wasn't five cents by five dollars, um, but I would I find it hard to imagine that it was a very reasonable spread at the time that you entered it, and now all of a sudden it's widened out to five cents by five dollars. We tend to find that most stock most options stay that way. So usually when you see that there are options that are trading at five cents by five dollars, that's a good sign that this is not a liquid symbol and that you may not want to enter that trade. So great questions, and I hopefully you know both of them provide you with a little context here. Um, Sonny is saying, could you please review GWO? GWO, um, Great West Life Co. So uh, I'm guessing that this is an insurance company, but 
uh, I'm not familiar with this company itself, but from the technicals, very interesting. You have a clear um, range that it trades in, breaks out, trades in the same similar type range for a similar range amount of time, breaks out above that range. So from my perspective, I don't see why this, you know, at least at this point, this wouldn't continue. It seems like these types of moves are all based off some type of news or perhaps some kind of earnings uh, that move this um, back in May and then in, in, in August. But, you know, overall, very strong technical score, meaning outperforming the broader markets. Uh, one month and six month trends are bullish. Recently broke out above a resistance level here around 27, let's just call it 2750 or so. After breaking out, it's coming to retest this level as support. So you're close to that support level again. So this is really where you do have another fairly attractive risk reward ratio, because if this gets below 20, it gets into that 27 level, which is about 60 cents of risk to the downside, I would consider cutting my losses. Or if it got down to the 26s, I would cut my loss. Because if you project up these moves, as we've seen here in the past, you know, I think you have quite a bit of room to the upside into the low 30s um, here for upside while risking only about you know, 60 to 70 cents of the downside for the stock itself. And then I would use strategies like a call or a call spread um, that really allow you to take advantage of this. So for example, if you bought this December 27 by 30 call spread for $1.05, your break-even price on this is only $28.05, which is about 50 cents higher than where it currently sits. And you have all the way through December for that to work out. So if the stock gets up to even 29, you're looking at a 90% return. But if it does get up to that $30 extended target, you're looking at about 185% return and you're only risking uh, $105 for every uh, $2,700 uh, of stock that you you know that you would need to own in order to buy 100 shares of that stock. So you're risking only about 3% of the underlying stock price, and you can potentially look at making somewhere between 90 and maybe 180% return at expiration if this um, trade works out here. So interesting stock. I don't know a lot about it, but you know certainly from the technicals. Uh, and the, um, the, the options, uh, from my perspective, looks like it could be potentially an attractive play here. Does the technical score relate to the bullishness of the stock? So, Jacques, the technical score has nothing to do with bullishness or bearishness. It tells you whether a stock is outperforming or underperforming the market. So, the, you know, so in, in a bull market, high technical scores certainly are bullish stocks, but you could be in a bear market. And what the high technical score is telling you is that the stock is not dropping as fast as the broader market. So let's say the market were to drop, and this is just <clears throat> for illustrative purposes, if the market were, were to drop 30% over the next, let's say, couple of months, like we saw during the coronavirus, and this stock only dropped 10%, this would be probably one of the best performing stocks in the market. It doesn't mean that it's bullish. It just means that it doesn't drop as much as the broader markets. If you're thinking about bullish or bearishness, that's when you want to use the trend indicators because the trend indicators give you a sense for direction. The technical, the technical score give you a sense for whether the stock is outperforming the markets. Now, when you're looking for bullish stocks, you generally want to seek both. You want a stock that's not only trending higher, but also beating the markets because stocks that are beating the markets are the stocks that that portfolio managers that investors want to hold in their portfolio those are the ones with the highest possibility of moving higher because if you own a stock that's underperformed the market but still moving higher guess what if the markets are moving 10 percent higher but the stock that you hold is only moving three percent higher you're more likely to sell that three percent stock and buy into a stock that's outperforming the market so that's why relative strength and trends are important for your investment decisions. Are there ideas on the left-hand side similar to your daily trading ideas? Um, yes, they are, because our daily trading ideas are picked from these types of ideas. Uh, Michelle saying, thanks for your presentation. Here's the situation. I'm bullish on one stock and buying and buy a call, but the stock turned into a loser. What percentage would you consider selling your position? Great question. So the question is, I like this particular stock, so I buy a call option, let's say I pay $1.25. At what point do I cut my losses 
on my options trade? So Michelle, the, the answer is usually pretty simple. The answer is about 50%. So if you have a dollar 25, what you want to do is you want to cut it at about 50% of that. So about 62 and a half cents is when you want to cut your losses on this dollar 25 loss. Um, that's usually how we think about um, when you want to cut your losses on a debit or a long call that you purchased. Is there any back test information in options play? So Jock, when we built options play, you know, we back tested almost every single strategy, cover calls, long calls, debit spreads, credit spreads. So while the back test information is not available to you, that back test information is built into the application and it's how we select our expiration dates, our strike prices. That's how we select our strategies is all based on these back tests. Um, Jock wants to look at IFC. Um, let's see, IFC. Intact Financial Corp. Intact Financial Corp. Now, this stock really has not made any progress whatsoever since, let's just call it um, late July. The stock has basically traded side, sideways since late July. That's why it has a weak technical score, because during this time, the markets have made progress. The markets have moved higher. When a stock is not moving higher when the broader markets are moving higher, that tells me that there's something uh, not so great about this particular stock. The one month trend is mildly bearish. The six month trend is bullish. As you can see, the broader trend is bullish, but over the past month or so, it's really hasn't moved higher at all. So from my perspective, there's not a whole lot of attractiveness to this particular stock. So when you have stocks like this, what you generally want to do is draw more of a range, right? So you see that there's a range here that the stock is trading in. When the stock is near the bottom of the range, that's an opportunity to potentially look for a buy. When it gets to the top of the range, that's perhaps an opportunity to sell. Right now, the stock is neither near the top of that range or at the bottom of the range. So from my perspective, there's not a whole lot to do until you get to one of those two places. Then I think there are some potential plays here. Um, there's another stock, GIBA, GIBA, CGI Inc. This is a very weak stock. As you can see, you know, over the past couple of uh, past, I would say close to six or seven months here has made no progress. So while the, st the markets are moving higher, this stock is not moving higher at all. And recently just started to break down here to the downside. Now this did get fairly uh, extended here, you know, so you have a pretty sharp move to the downside. That's why you have this asterisk sign that's telling you that it's a little overextended meaning it's, a little, it's gone a little too far too fast. And notice that it's just near the bottom of this range. So again, you have a stock that's trading range bound. It's getting near the bottom of that range, perhaps a little bit oversold here. And this could be potentially an opportunity to go long. Um, that is if it's a stock that you perhaps fundamentally like. Um, otherwise, you know, there's a possibility that the stock's gonna break even lower here. So it depends on you know, your views on this particular stock, but the fact that it underperforms the market by a substantial amount, from my perspective, is not a particularly weak stock. But if you know something fundamentally about this stock that you think is, you know, now an attractive price to buy, you know, this could be you know, a potential entry opportunity for a long. Otherwise, this is a stock that I generally would stay away from. Let's see, RBA, RBA, Ritchie Brothers Auctioneer. So strong stock, clearly, as you can see, strong outperformer, came back to retest broke out to a new high, but could not sustain it and is now back below. That's not a particularly strong price action that we generally see, even though it's a relatively strong stock. One month and six months trend has started to trend lower here. So made an attempt to make a new high, but has now failed and is now starting to trend lower here. So from my perspective, at the very least, I think that this is a stock that could revisit these lows and then perhaps continue to move higher here. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the fundamentals of this company, but I would certainly watch when it gets to this level, how it responds. If it breaks below, then I think you have a lot more room to the downside. If it holds that level, then I think you have at least a fair chance of getting back to that $84 level here to the upside. Um, where can I look for Delta? Great question. So you can click on the blue arrow of any symbol. And at the very bottom, it'll say explain strategy in Greeks. And that's where we're going to show you the Delta. But we're also in the process of 
adding delta to your strike dropdown so that you actually get the delta number next to the strike price, the premium, and the delta. So that is something that we are building into options play. John wants to take a look at Enbridge. I haven't taken a look at Enbridge in a while, but very similar to pretty much all other energy stocks here. You know, energy continues to underperform. Uh, you know, on, on the day when the markets are down one and a half percent, Enbridge is down 1.6%. Uh, bearish trends underperform the market. From my perspective, there really isn't a whole lot to be interesting interested in these particular names. I don't see a good reason why these just don't continue moving lower here from these levels. So I, I don't see a good catalyst or thesis for a turnaround here for energy. If anything, I think energy is dying a slow death that has been on track pretty much for the last three to four years. It's just been accelerated a bit due to the coronavirus. Mohammed, hey Tony, what's the percent? What percentage is a good bid ask spread for liquidity? It's, it's, um, you know, for example, five percent difference between the bid and ask price. Um, you know, we tend to find that you know in the ten percent range. Under ten percent range is more than okay in terms of for you to enter an order. Um, but even if you see a spread larger than twenty percent of it uh, or ten percent, even if it, if it's a trade that you really want to enter, just remember that you can calculate a fair value off of the midpoint, just start off the midpoint and don't pay more than, uh, you know, let's say 5% off of that midpoint because then you're paying a substantial margin. So it's less about what's quoted, it's more about how much you pay above the midpoint. Um, you could have a large spread, but if you pay only 10 cents above the midpoint, that's okay. So, you know, again, bid ask spreads many times can be deceiving. Um, use the midpoint to your advantage and place an order. And if you don't get filled, that's okay. You don't get filled, right? Um, there's no harm in, in not getting filled. Um, but work your order. Start at the midpoint and work your way out. Um, Serge wants to look at ATD, ATD.B. Um, so this is similar to some of the other charts that we looked at where Basically, since let's just call it July, the stock has made no progress while the markets have moved higher here. And it's now trading near the bottom of that range. So um, I don't, again, I don't know a lot about the fundamentals of this particular company, but it is, it has a fairly, uh, you know, established range here between 47 and 42, let's call it, and is near the bottom of that range. So if you're bullish on this particular stock, I certainly think that now is a good attractive entry here because you have fair amount of upside. While if the stock gets down into the, I would say the low 40s, you know, 41 or so, then I would simply cut my losses and get out of the trade. So you're only risking about a dollar and a half to the downside while you have about $5 upside uh, here, um, you know, to the top of that range. So the way I would view it is that the the risk reward here for a long position is not particularly bad, but it is a weak stock and is underperforming the market and is trending lower here. So generally speaking, not the type of uh, uh, bullish setup that I that I would look for here. Um, LSPD, uh, Lightspeed. This is a stock that's very consistent from the perspective of notice how on, on many of the other names that we talked about over the past few months, the trade, the stock has moved sideways here over the last couple of months, as you can see, very clear uptrend. And if you look at this uptrend from a channel perspective, the stock is trading near the bottom of that channel. And that could be an opportunity to look for a long position here. So this is a good example of a strong stock. One month, it's, uh, you know, the technical score of 10 telling me it's outperforming the market. One month and six month trend. So the one month is mildly bearish, but the six month trend is mildly bullish. That's actually not a bad opportunity because many times, as you can see here, when you're near the bottom of this channel, when we look at this channel and draw it this way, when it's near the bottom of that channel, it very well many times is the six month trend is kind of neutral or bearish, but the six month trend remains bullish. That's exactly what we see here is that the one month trend is, is neutral, but the six month trend is bullish. That is an opportunity to potentially look for that long position here. So LSPD from a technical perspective, from a relative, relative strength perspective, looking fairly strong here. 
where can we find out what the short open interest is on stocks? So Dean, unfortunately, I, I, I actually don't know. Um, however, I don't, I don't particularly use that as an indicator simply because short interest is not something, it's not a real time indicator. It's a delayed data feed. So I don't like to use that in my particular trading. Michelle is saying, do the market makers use the black shoals? No, they, they use more sophisticated um, uh, models than black shoals. Black shoals is not particularly good with discrete dividends. So um, they use more sophisticated models, usually a binomial type model or modification of a binomial model to estimate uh, um, to estimate the pricing of an option. Uh, Richard wants to look at BLDP, Ballard Power Systems. So this is a stock that is, if you look at on the long term, fairly out, you know, uh, staying on par with the markets. But this stock clearly has long, has short periods of very extreme outperformance, and then extreme periods of underperformance, as we're seeing this recently here. So this is one that's very choppy, even though overall it is performing or outperforming the broader markets here. But it goes, it goes through these fairly volatile periods here. It is trading near the bottom of this range around this $18, eight, let's just call it $19 support level here. It is trading near the bottom of that range. So this is potentially an opportunity to go long if this is a stock that you like from a fundamental perspective. The stock down 4% today does tell me that this is a very, very volatile stock. So I think you need to know a little bit more about the stock as an investor than just simply off the technicals or fundamentals, because this is such a volatile stock. I would imagine that options here are actually quite expensive here, depending on whether you're bullish or bearish. Yeah, so a call option here costs $2.50 on a $20 stock. That means you're paying more than 10% of the underlying stock's value just to buy a call option. Uh, and even at $1.75, you're just under 10%. That's still a very large percentage of risk on a call option that expires in just you know roughly a little under two months. This does report earnings here in 10 days, which could explain why the options are a bit more expensive. Um, but this is one that's clearly is very volatile. Please review Shopify. Let's take a look at Shopify. So Shopify, similar type thing, right? One of the strongest stocks in the Canadian markets off of those March lows, but over the past couple of months have made no progress pretty much since July. The stock was trading around 1300. It's still trading at 1300. This tells me that this is a stock that is starting to lose strength here. And notice how we've had four identical tops here around this 1460, 1480 level. So quadruple top here at this level. The stock can't seem to get past that level. You know, when you have markets that continue to make new higher highs, but this stock continues to fail at the same price, that's not particularly attractive here from my perspective. I think that speaks to a higher risk of a, of a pullback here into the markets rather than a rally and break to new all-time highs. That's my view here just because of that um, underperformance that it's starting to see against the broader markets here. How do dividends impact my call or put premium? So, you know, dividends are already priced into your call or put premium. So they don't really necessarily impact the call and put premiums uh, per se. Um, but, it, you know, you do have to factor into whether you're long or short the call or put to determine how dividends do impact your call or puts. But effectively, they are, uh, they are effectively built into the price of your call or put premiums. What does it mean when the stock has a bullish trend and good technical score, but the bullish options plays below 80? Um, that means that the stock, you know, setup looks pretty good, but the options are not very liquid. So here's an example, Shopify. Options are, are very, very expensive here. Now, let me take a look. It seems like it's because they haven't listed strikes above 1460. That's one of the problems here. So let's just look at the call option here. So the December 1340 call option costs $12,000. On a $1,300 uh, a, a $1, stock, that's almost 9% uh, of the underlying stock's value. That's why the options play score is so poor. You could be very bullish on the stock. It could be a very bullish stock, but that doesn't mean the call options are cheap. So that's why you have a strong stock 
bullish trends, but a relatively low options play score. Can you take a look at BlackBerry, please? Let's take a look at BlackBerry. Um, so this particular stock, similar, you know, from my perspective, neutral stock, one month and six month trends are, are not bullish or bearish, particularly say, and you are in this in this range. And when, you, when you're stuck in a range, what do you wanna do? You wanna wait to, for it to either be at the bottom of the range or wait for it to be at the top of the range. That's where you have the most opportunity. It is not near either one of those in my opinion at the moment. So I would be a little bit more patient, wait for this stock to get near the top of that range and sell some premium. If it gets near the bottom of the range, perhaps buy some premium. But this is an, an op, there are certainly are opportunities. I just think that you want to be a little bit more patient on a stock like BlackBerry. Okay, um, I've I've tried to answer as many questions as I have time for here today. I really appreciate everyone taking the time out here this morning um, or this afternoon rather to learn more about you know options trading and how you can utilize the information that's available to you from your bid ask quotes to gauge liquidity here so i hopefully you know give you gave you a good review of that so that you can go back and learn this on your own especially for those of you that want to watch that recording we will send out the recording here today with everyone else so you can take your time with the slides watch the recording and make sure you understand these concepts before you continue trading and hopefully this helps change your perspective on how you view risk on your trades in order to hopefully shift you know, your ability to become profitable as a trader. So with that, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great afternoon and I'll see you guys here uh, the following week. Thank you so much. And, and next week on, I'm sorry, not next week, the week after on, on November 9th, I have a special session with Steve Sosnick for Interactive Brokers. I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be a session where Steve and I are just going to talk about the markets. A lot of questions today about different stocks and different markets. So make sure you join us there on uh, November 9th. Uh, we'll be sending out an email about that very shortly because that's an opportunity for those of you that want to ask some strategist questions about the market. That's going to be the best session for that. So I hope that you'll be able to join us and uh, have a great evening and I'll see you guys here next week.